Good afternoon. Welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, it's really a great pleasure uh, to, int to introduce uh, Mitch Silver, uh, who is an old friend of the New America Foundation, who is the Director of Intelligence <coughs> Analysis at the NYPD, um, where he's just written a, a really brilliant new book uh, called The Al-Qaeda Factor, which I think is both deeply researched and also very clearly written, unlike a lot of other books that I have to read in this area. Um, and um, <clears throat> based on Mitch's very deep dive into terrorism cases uh, throughout the West and Al-Qaeda's involvement or lack of involvement in those cases, um, <clears throat> Mitch also co-authored the uh, uh, Radicalization in the West. Is that the correct title of the, the MIPD report that attracted a lot of attention in 2009? He's a graduate of Columbia's SEPA school. Interestingly, he spent nine years uh, essentially in corporate finance, is that correct? Right. So uh, it's unusual for somebody, I think, at NYPD to come out, out of that background. Um, and so <coughs> Mitch will address uh, the subject of his uh, book today, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And uh, take it away, Mitch. All right. Yeah, Peter, I had sent some slides to Andrew, but I don't oh. see them, but I'll leave oh, you with that. Uh, that's okay. Slides. That's right. We'll wing you with that. <clears throat> we'll get them. Andrew left, unfortunately, <laughs> yesterday. <I> took, <laughs> I, I took the slides with it. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank uh, the New America Foundation for hosting me today. Uh, we've actually had uh, both Peter Bergen and Stephen Cole up at uh, NYPD speaking to our personnel uh, to help them be more informed the nature of the changing threat uh, and specifically looking at Al-Qaeda uh, and uh, how it's morphed over time. And in fact, uh, both, uh, both Ghost Wars and, and Peter Bergen's books sort of required reading for our, uh, for our analytical cadre. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to walk you through uh, the nature of the book, uh, The Al-Qaeda Factor. And let me bring you back to September 11th. Um, in September 11, 2001, because September 11th really changed the world's perception of Al Qaeda. Uh, what had been considered a small band of revolutionary terrorists with a capability limited to attacking Western targets in the Middle East and Africa was now something very different. Suddenly, the group's threat profile had changed drastically, and the perception of Al Qaeda's capabilities, strengths, uh, an ability to project force was boosted to an entirely different order of power. Subsequent plots against the West perpetuated this new idea of Al-Qaeda as an organization that spanned the globe, had a thought out and precise strategy to defeat the West. In what I believe was a classic case of mirror imaging, uh, imagining the enemy's characteristics to reflect your own, the perception grew that Al-Qaeda was highly organized, rigidly centralized and had deployed recruiters, operatives, and sleeper cells to the West who could be activated on command. These Al-Qaeda agents were supposedly able to spot recruits, send them back to Afghanistan and Pakistan for training, and then launch them back to the West under the precise command and control of Al-Qaeda to carry out plots that would fill out the organization's strategic aims. More than 10 years after September 11, 2001, we now know this to be untrue. Instead, we know that the role of Al-Qaeda core in global jihadist plots against the West has actually varied significantly over time, and not all of what have been generally termed Al-Qaeda plots have had equivalent involvement by Al-Qaeda. This prompted the question that really drives the study. How much is Al-Qaeda involved in the Al-Qaeda plots? And that actually was the original title for the book until Penn Press mercifully uh, fixed that and, and put me out of my misery and came up with the Al-Qaeda factor. Uh, but this is really a fundamental question, because if we were to truly understand the nature of the threat posed by the transnational jihad led by Al-Qaeda, we have to have a greater and more nuanced understanding of the genesis of plots and their execution. Al-Qaeda's core's role shouldn't be overestimated or underestimated because important resource allocations derive from the answer to these questions. It affects military, intelligence, policing activities that are dedicated to preventing the next attack. So in a sense, determining where the action is for the plot, uh, or in military terms, what Prussian military theorist Karl von Clausewitz called the center of gravity, or critical element of strength for Al-Qaeda is key to provide insights on how to thwart them. And to date, not enough attention had been focused on this issue. So essentially what I did is I looked at what I believe to be 16 of the most important Al-Qaeda plots against the West 
since 1993. So 16 plots over an 18 year time period, uh, this was to test for consistency. And the West, North America, Europe, and Australia, you have geographic diversity. And essentially, you know, as uh, someone from New York City, looking at Al Qaeda's plots uh, in environments that are similar to New York. Uh, so really restricting it to, to the West. Um, most of the plots you're familiar with, these are the big ones. 93 Trade Center, the Millennium Plot against LAX, the 9-11 plot, shoe bombers, uh, the Lackawanna cluster, Operation Rhyme, which was Deer and Barreau, and the gas limo plots, where he did surveillance on the Citicorp building and the stock exchange in New York, as well as some locations in the UK. Operation Crevice, another UK plot where individuals were targeting either a shopping center or a nightclub uh, with ammonium nitrate devices. The Madrid attacks of 2004. The Hofstede Group and their assassination of Theo van Gogh in uh, the Netherlands in 2004. Um, the 7-7 attacks in London. The 721 attacks two weeks later with five suicide bombers in the London metro. Uh, Operation Pendennis, a plot in Australia against the Australia Football League Championship. Um, the Toronto 18. Uh, Operation Overt, the transatlantic liquid bomb plot with the uh, Gatorade type bottles. Operation Dagger, a plot in Copenhagen. Uh, and then finally, Operation High Rise, which is the Najib Balazazi plot from summer of 2009. So these were the big plots. These are the ones that either caused the most damage or had the potential to m cause the most damage. Um, so what were my research sources for this? Because clearly there's been a lot written in the media and how, you know, why was I going to provide anything more value added than what's already in the New York Times or the Daily Telegraph? Um, the key thing was that I was able to get access to the legal documents, essentially the trial transcripts uh, from the UK, from the US, Australia, Canada. And as a researcher, I have to say, you know, getting to the primary source material is always key. But really embedded in these trial transcripts, in the detail of where do these individuals meet, what, was it, what happened at that fateful meeting in Pakistan where they decided that, you know what, instead of doing something in Afghanistan because there was no need for foreign fighters, they made the decision to turn and do something against the UK. So all of those details, who they met, who facilitated their travel, is all embedded in the trial transcripts. And that was really what sort of uh, gave me a unique uh, insight into these plots. So how did I measure what was the al-Qaeda factor for the plots? Uh, essentially what I did is I looked at a variety of different points in the evolution of the plot and asked the question, well, what was al-Qaeda's role here? Uh, so one of the things I look at, and essentially each plot is a chapter in the book. So for um, each plot, I said, what about the scene, the social environment that sort of preceded the development of the plot? Did al-Qaeda set that up? Did they send the blind sheikh to New York City specifically with the mission to organize a group of followers who could then be utilized to attack the World Trade Center? Or did that happen organically or fortuitously? What about the cluster? the group of individuals who sort of formed that proto-conspiracy. Uh, did Al-Qaeda pick out who the 7-7 bombers were going to be in London? Or did they uh, organize themselves and, and self-choose? What about the connections to Al-Qaeda? Did Al-Qaeda send recruiters to London, to New York City, to find the Najib Balazazi and find him and send him back to Afghanistan and Pakistan for training? Um, what about the plot conception? Was this a plot that Al-Qaeda had on the shelf? like the idea that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had for using planes to hit buildings, only awaiting individuals who could be trained to fly planes? Or is this a plot designed by the men living in uh, communities outside of Madrid saying, you know what, this is the way we're going to coerce Spain to get out of the Iraq war. We're going to hit them just before the elections. And what about the plot launch? What was the role of al-Qaeda's chief of external operations? Was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed involved? Uh, Abu Abayd al-Masri or some of the other individuals who have had this sort of number three spot in al-Qaeda? Or is this a plot that a group of men in Toronto conceived of themselves? What about the target selection? Um, again, was this something that al-Qaeda determined will hit the World Trade Center, the Capitol building, um, and the Pentagon? Or did the individuals decide, hey, we're a group of individuals in, in Australia. What will, hit, what will hurt Australia most? What will coerce them to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan? Hit them at their Australia football championship. Um, what about the casing of targets? Did al-Qaeda send someone to look at the New York Stock Exchange and the World Bank down in D.C. here, like they sent Deere and Barreau in 2000 and 2001? Or did the individual say, you know what, 
we've been on the London tube. We don't need to case it out. Um, and they sort of you know, took advantage of that familiarity. What about the communications with Al Qaeda? Was it like 9-11 where you had Ramzi bin al-Sheib? He had one phone to call Mohammed Atta, who was in the United States, and one phone to call Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was still in Afghanistan. So he was almost a human link man for the plot. Um, or did the communications just come at the end of the plot, let's say with Zazi, where at the last minute he decided or realized that, you know what, I don't know the, the exact recipe for the device. Better email Al Qaeda. So there was no communications, no control of the plot until the last minute when the guy decided, realized he didn't have the uh, ability to make the uh, explosive device. What about logistics? Did Al Qaeda fund the plot with $500,000 for 9 11 or provide $12,000 to Ahmed Rassam, who was involved, uh, who was leading the LAX Millennium plot? And then lastly, what about the weaponization? Did Al Qaeda provide the shoes, the explosive underwear, or these individuals? potentially uh, exchange uh, hashish for dynamite, as they did in Madrid, in order to get the uh, capability to carry out the plot. So essentially, along this um, trajectory of the plot, I asked that question at different points to try and find out what was precisely Al-Qaeda's role, because really only through that deep dive can you get to the nuance. Um, what falls out of it is a schematic where people are in a scene, they break off into a cluster, uh, they decide bottom up to sort of travel overseas generally, and oftentimes they may not even link up directly with Al Qaeda. They may link up with LET, Lashkari Taiba, uh, like Diram Baro did, or Omar Khayyam from the Crevice Plot. Or they may link up with Jaishi Mohammed, like Rashid Raouf, who was involved in the 2006 airline plot. And then these individuals, through links, hook up with Al Qaeda, and then they're sent back to the West to carry out a plot where they carry out their operational cycle, where they do their target selection, where they do their casing, their logistics, and their weaponization. So, you know, looking at the 16 different plots, trying to figure out where the commonalities are and what sort of lessons can be drawn from them, one of the things that, that falls out is that for each one of these, the story begins in the West. Even you know, if we're talking about the 9-11 plot, you have to look at Mohammed Atta, Ramzi bin al-Sheib, Ziad Jara, living in Hamburg, Germany. And essentially, although most of the conspirators for the 9-11 plot were, were all born in the Middle East, if not for this period of radicalization in Hamburg for Atta and three out of the four pilots, um, that plot doesn't go forward. But really across the board, we're talking about uh, the Hofstede group, with the Copenhagen plot or uh, the Montreal, uh, the LAX plot, you know, where expatriate uh, Algerians are living in Montreal. The story begins in all 16 plots, really, with individuals living in the West. These are the people who end up being the primary conspirators uh, in the plot. Once you move beyond that, you see something that I call the scene. And the scene, you've seen the movie The Social Network. Um, the scene you can think of as sort of the jihadi social network. Um, and in a sense, it's what precedes terrorism. Um, just like any type of social network, there are hubs, uh, there are nodes, and people are bouncing around like electrons. So what's a hub? A hub could be the Finsbury Mosque in London, could be the Al Farouk Mosque in London. Um, it could be Speaker's Corner in London where people are seeing someone uh, talk um, about terrorist acts or about uh, foreign policy overseas. It, there are hubs where people go and, uh, and meet. There are ideologues in the scene. If you're in New York City, it might be the Blind Sheikh. If you're in London, it could be Abu Qatar or Abu Hamza al-Masri. Um, in, uh, in Toronto, it was the janitor at the mosque. But there are ideologues in the scene. And the scene has sort of irregular borders. You can almost imagine something amoeba-like where people pass, move in and out of the scene. Um, university Muslim Student Associations. At some universities, they may be particularly politically active uh, and uh, espouse extremist views. So people spend time in some of these uh, student associations. And there's a mirror image of this online. Uh, and instead of certain mosques and certain hangouts, replace it with a chat room, a pal talk room, uh, a Facebook page. So there's, a, there's sort of a, a cyber variant of this. But essentially, in looking at all of different plots um, and seeing how did people get into the scene, and you can think of Londonistan sort of as the scene in a sense, um, there are two on-ramps to it. 
One is reactionary Islam. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that people develop an intellectual framework that has a binary worldview. It's the believer versus the unbeliever. They adopt this set of views that says, you know what, there's only a literalist interpretation of Islam that is correct. Um, and that uh, Islam and democracy are incompatible. Uh, and I'll be crude for a second, but I'll quote one of the guys from the Operation Pendennis Australian plot. He said, listen, Allah's law is the only law worthy of ruling mankind. Democracy is full of shit. So clearly not an intellectual, but this is intellectual framework that he's bringing to the table, that Islam and democracy are incompatible. And some of these individuals may join uh, the Salafis, they may join the Tablighi Jamaat. And again, this isn't terrorism, but this is espousing a, a literalist interpretation that sets them on a pathway where under some circumstances, violence is acceptable. But some people come to the scene uh, or the sort of the social network and they're not coming to it from a religious standpoint. They're really coming to it from a political standpoint. Almost a clash of civilization, Samuel Huntington. There's a war against Islam. Uh, the West has invaded Muslim lands and there are, there are certain type, there, there are grievances there and it's a set of narratives. So that requires some type of action. So what do these people do? They join organizations that are activists. They may join the Muslim Brotherhood or Al Muhajirun if you're in London, or Hizba Tahrir, or if you're in New York City, you might join Revolution Muslim, um, or Islamic Thinker Societies. Some of these groups that uh, demonstrate, they've got a black flag either over 10 Downing Street or over the White House, depending on where you are, and essentially they believe that by demonstrating provocatively, they're going to change, change the world. Um, and you know, for each one of the different plots, there's a scene you can talk about, but essentially, um, you know, that shows where these people originated from. Um, and in the book, you know, I, I talk about, let's say, in the uh, transatlantic liquid bomb plot, that's a lot of the individuals started out with Tablighi Jamaat in Walthamstow and High Wycom in London. Uh, after that, some of them went overseas and, and worked in camps where they were helping uh, refugees from Afghanistan uh, in, in Pakistan, and that mobilized them to want to take some action. They get back to London, they're involved in the university scene, they're leaders of student groups, and they're politically active, demonstrating against the Iraq war. But again, this isn't terrorism, but what happens next gets you closer. And what happens next is that people actually decide that, you know what, prayer, proselytization, political activism, that's not enough to change the world. And actually what they decide is they have, they reject the scene. And you know, again, this comes out of the trial transcripts, but you have someone like an Omar Khayyam or Muhammad Janaid Babar, guys involved from this uh, Operation Crevice to attack uh, either a mall or a nightclub in London saying, you know what, al Muhajirun, all they do is talk, talk, talk. And essentially, that's not good enough. That's not changing the world. So they decide they need to take a much more activist approach. Um, so they actually reject the scene as too passive, not changing the world, and they spin off. They break off with a group of friends, maybe people they grew up with, maybe people they went to university with, and they meet in a private location. If you're in Sydney, Australia, you may be, be, you may be meeting in the Halal Butcher Shop in Lakemba in Sydney. Um, if you're up in Leeds, Beeston, and Dewsbury in northern England, where the 7-7 bombers came from, you may be in the al bookstore. Uh, if you're in New York City, you may be in a bookstore called Islamic Books and Tapes, um, you know, which was a place where individuals involved in the Herald Square plot hung out. But essentially, individuals break off into a private place. Usually their ideologue is still involved with them. Um, and they sit there. Or if you're in Hamburg, you're in Muhammad Atta's apartment. And you debate, what is required of me? Do, where do we fight? Should we go to Chechnya? Should we go to uh, Israel? Should we go to Afghanistan? What should we do? And essentially, this is really what happened in a lot of these cases. Um, in Lackawanna, New York, upstate New York, um, you know, what the men were told was, listen, um, you need to wake up. People are dying overseas in Bosnia and Chechnya and Israel, and you're doing nothing to stop it. So these individuals felt guilt about living in the West. And from their sessions, they called the halakas, where they would discuss politics and religion over pizza, they eventually decided in the summer or the, uh, <clears throat> in the spring of 2001, they needed to go overseas, they needed to go to Afghanistan. That was really going to be the only way that they could redeem themselves. And they went as a group of high school friends. These were all guys who had played soccer for Lackawanna High School, had American girlfriends, were dating the cheerleader. But at a certain point, they decided that some type of action was required for them. Interestingly enough, 
you know, in these plots, um, a person who often gets talked about, the recruiter, didn't really appear. Instead, somebody else appeared. And I've given him the name, and he's really an archetype called the fixer. And the fixer is someone who essentially, he knows someone who can get you into a camp. He's not a recruiter in the sense that he's been sent top down from the organization to solicit people. Um, he's someone, let's say, um, like uh, Abdurouf Hanachi in Montreal, who went to an Al-Qaeda camp, came back and was telling this group of expatriate Algerians who were hanging out in Montreal because the Algerian Civil War was going on, doing petty criminality. Hey, I just went overseas. You wouldn't believe the experience I had. It was sort of like outward bound with guns. Mm -hmm. And um, you know what? If you're a petty criminal living in Montreal, like Ahmed Rassam, uh, Mustafa Lapsi, this sounds great. So what do you say? Listen, I'd like to go. Um, you know, can, how, can you set this up for me? And sure enough, Hanachi could do it. He reached out to a connection to a connection. And who did he hook up with? Abu Zubaydah. Um, so these individuals, um, Akhmer Sam, ends up going overseas. Not because an Al-Qaeda recruiter came into town, because of the fixer. Um, and why do these guys want to go overseas? What is it? Well, there are a number of reasons. Number one, they want to go overseas to fight coalition forces. Uh, they don't feel like they're doing enough in London or Montreal uh, or in Flushing, Queens. Uh, so like Zazi, they wanted to go overseas and fight. Paramilitary training. Uh, this is what the guys from Lackawanna were looking for. They wanted to sort of have that outward bound experience. Skill development. The leader of the 2006 airline plot with these uh, Gatorade bottles actually said, you know what, it turns out that trying to make a hydrogen peroxide uh, explosive device is kind of dangerous. So I don't want to do it at home. I want to learn from someone who knows how to do it. And this was a guy who was going to explode it over in a plane over the Atlantic with eight other flights simultaneously. Provide supplies. Sometimes they want to travel to Afghanistan and Pakistan and find out what does Al-Qaeda need? Do you need money? Do you need boots? Do you need tents? Uh, like the Operation Crevice guys or sanction or direction. Someone like Adir and Barreau, who had come up with all of these proposals for plots, brought them to Al-Qaeda to find out, almost like uh, looking for funding from a venture capitalist, you know, will you endorse it? So these are some of the reasons that people go overseas. But essentially, more often than not, it's a bottom-up initiative. Um, you're looking at the 7-7 seven, seven plot, some other interesting things come out of this, and, and that is that there's repeat travel to uh, Pakistan. In fact, Muhammad Siddiqui Khan, who's the leader of the 7-7 seven, seven plot, travels three times uh, to Pakistan before he comes back to London and explodes himself on the subway. Interestingly enough, the first time he goes, uh, and Peter's written about this, is because of Kashmiri concerns. Uh, he went with one other associate, Wahid Ali, and what did Wahid Ali say? He said, listen, there's nothing common about going to train in Pakistan. Islamically or morally, it was correct if you wanted to help your Muslim brothers. It's just the whole romantic idea of going, training, helping your brothers. We all came back out of 100, 90 percent. So this idea that for Kashmiri issues, grievances, concerns, you might travel to Pakistan, and that might, through connections, end up being the way you link up to Al-Qaeda, like Deir and Barreau. Um, and Mohammed Siddiqui Khan, the first time he went, he joined. He was trained by a group called Harkat al-Mujahideen, H-U-M. The bus literally picked them up at the airport, but that was okay. It was a Kashmiri issue. It wasn't Al-Qaeda. It was 2001. Um, but ultimately, he travels overseas again in 2003, sent by a fixer sent by a taxi driver who lives in Luton, uh, north of London, named Mohammed Q. Khan, who says, go to Afghanistan and find out what does Al-Qaeda need. Do they need money? Do they need supplies? Do they need fighters? So he goes on a fact-finding trip. And that trip ends up putting him on the pathway to linking to Al-Qaeda and subsequently being one of four suicide bombers in London. But essentially, this, this is a, you know, a pattern that repeats itself, whether we're talking about Ahmed Rassam or Zazi or someone like Mukhtar Ibrahim, the leader of the 721 plot. Um, again, it's traveled to, to Pakistan and, and a certain frequency to it. Um, what also sort of comes out of the analysis is that there have been varying roles for Al-Qaeda's chief of external operations. In some situations, let's say like Richard Reed and his associate, um, Sajid Badat, who went overseas, they actually link up with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed gives them a very specific mission. Just like 9-11, these are the shoes, you're going to wear them on a transatlantic plot, and that's what you're going to do. And when they come back to Paris and London, respectively, 
there's someone who I've called the link man involved. It's actually Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's nephew, uh, Omar al Baluchi, And he's literally the guy who's got the two phones or the two email addresses. One to email Richard Reed and find out when he's going, if he's going, make sure he's going. And another to you know his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, to let him know what the progress of the plot is. Uh, so that link man is sort of a cutout who provides a little bit of a distance between the Al-Qaeda chief of external operations and the conspirators in the West. But that's an example of specific direction by Al-Qaeda uh, given to wear these shoes on these flights. What you also sometimes is have suggestion. Um, and going back to the uh, 1999 um, Millennium Plot targeting Los Angeles, where Ahmed Rassam, you know, goes for his uh, outward bound with guns type experience, and he and some other expatriate Algerians come up with the idea to hit LAX airport on the eve of the Millennium. They talk about that idea with Abu Qatada, uh, and at that point, Abu Qatada isn't actually part of al-Qaeda. He's an emir in his own right, considered on the same level of bin Laden. Abu Qatada, um, I'm sorry, Abu Zubaydah, you know, endorses that, gives them money, gives them hexamine uh, tablets, and essentially they go on their way to uh, target LAX. But that was an example of sort of more suggestion and endorsement. So the plots, there's a typology. So there are three different types. One is command and control plots. You met someone with al-Qaeda. They commanded you, hit this target during this time period, and this is how you do it. And there was control. They called you up to make sure that you're actually going to commit, go through with the plot. The 2006 airline plot, Rashid Raouf was emailing, calling the guys. When are you going? Um, are you being surveilled? Checking in on them. Then there are plots that are suggested and are endorsed. Um, you know what? We already have enough fighters here in Afghanistan, but you've got a UK passport. Why don't you do something for the cause in the UK? A uh, similar thing happened with Zazi. Zazi and his two associates arrive in Afghanistan and Pakistan. They want to fight coalition forces. Um, Sali al Somali and people involved in external operations say, wait a second. We, you know, we don't need you to do that. Why don't you go back to New York in September of 2009 and carry out a plot there? You know, make sure it's, it's you know, in a place where you kill a lot of people, potentially mass transportation, but the date and the exact way they do it is left up to the conspirators. So less of an al-Qaeda role in those plots. And then lastly, there are those that are inspired. There are plots where really al-Qaeda, you haven't met anyone from al-Qaeda, they haven't given you any direction, but you act on your own. The Madrid bombers in 2004, the Toronto 18, who said, listen, we're not officially al-Qaeda, but we share their principles and methods. And had they committed the attack, they were going to carry out the attack in the name of the al-Qaeda organization in Canada. Is there an al-Qaeda organization in Canada? Absolutely not. But clearly, these guys were inspired by al-Qaeda. And that's the in, in whose name they wanted to carry out the plot. Um, a little bit in terms of all the anatomy of these uh, plots, and it's almost biological because if you look at the, uh, the conspirators who carry out these plots, um, you can divide them into three categories. And you can almost envision a, a cell with a nucleus. And inside the nucleus is what I call the active core. These are the one or two people um, who without them, the plot doesn't go forward. No Naji Balazazi, there is no Zazi plot. Uh, no Muhammad Atta. Probably not a 9-11 plot in that way. Uh, no Muhammad Siddiqui Khan, no 7-7 plot in London. These are the people who are essential for the plot. Um, in, a, in a circle around them are, are who I call the followers. And the followers are people who may do some reconnaissance. They may buy the materiel for the device. They may even be willing to be three of the other suicide bombers or two of the other suicide bombers. But they're followers. Um, they wouldn't do it without the leadership of the people in the active core. And then if you do another concentric circle, you have people who I call the periphery. And who's in the periphery? Well, in the periphery is often the ideologue. Let's say in the 1993 plot, the blind sheikh wasn't able to be indicted or tried for his involvement in the plot. Was he in the mix? Did he know what was going on? Did he sort of set the stage? Absolutely. So, um, and in the UK, they're dealing with this issue where they have people like Abu Qatada who they can't try him for anything, but they know he was in the mix in a lot of these, or at least on the periphery of these conspiracies. Also, who's in the, in the periphery? The wives, uh, cousins, relatives. Um, you know, if you're talking about the July 21 plot in London, these were the people who, after the plot failed and the five explosive devices didn't work correctly, they were the ones who were going to distribute the video. They helped one individual get out of uh, the UK and get to Italy. Um, these are people who are often arrested 
when the plot gets taken down, but are let go because there's not enough uh, detail or in information to try them for the actual involvement in the conspiracy. A great example of this is the Toronto 18. Um, four people in the active core, about uh, 10 people in the fo who are followers, and then a bunch of people in the periphery. And who's in the periphery? And the periphery is the ideologue, the janitor at the mosque who played basketball with the boys, gave them the ideology, but wasn't involved in the actual conspiracy. Who else is in the periphery? The wives. One of the wives of the Toronto 18 actually had a prenuptial agreement with her husband. If you don't go ahead and commit violent jihad, I get a divorce. So did she know something was going on with her husband? For sure. Um, in the Zazi plot, when he was building the TATP in his, in his uncle's garage in Aurora, Colorado, his uncle walked in and, and saw this. And was, what is this? And Zazi said, this is uh, some type of birth control device I'm making. Uh, this is true. And you know, did the uncle uh, know something was going on? Of course he did. Uh, but he didn't turn him in, and uh, actually the uncle is, is, has been, was prosecuted you know, for lying to federal authorities. But people in the periphery know something is going on. They may not know the details of the conspiracy, but they're certainly aware and to some degree permissive um, you know, that, that it's going forward. But you know, that cluster of people, the active core, the followers, the periphery, when they're back in the West, that's really, as we move further and further from 9-11, where they're doing the target selection, the casing, the logistics, and the weaponization, and the communications to al-Qaeda. Uh, there's an ex another example, like the Zazi plot, this Operation Crevice that I've mentioned, where, again, right at the end, Omar Khayyam forgot the precise uh, mix for the ammonium nitrate device, and what does he do? He emails his colleague uh, in Pakistan to get that information. Um, and, you know, and that reach back to Pakistan and Afghanistan has actually been a key point where some of these plots have been thwarted, Zazi specifically among others, um, because there's that communications that signals intelligence uh, can pick up. But that really sort of gets to you know that point of well, if all of the if a lot of the action for the plot is happening in the West, you know where is the center of gravity? Just to zoom up, zoom out to let's say 10,000 feet and, and sort of wrap it up. Um, you know, I like to end on sort of where I believe we've been and where we're going with the Al Qaeda threat. Um, and I would say from 2001 to 2004, um, you could almost envision sort of a, you know, one big red blob as the Al Qaeda core. We know who hit us on September 11th. It was an organization. It had some structure. There were a couple of affiliates and allies, Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines, Jema Islamiyah in Indonesia, and after we went into Iraq, uh, Al Qaeda of Mesopotamia. Um, but that was really what we were talking about when we were talking about the greater Al Qaeda threat plus Al Qaeda emitting their ideology. You fast forward to 2004, and the picture starts to get a lot more complicated. And I would almost use a cancer uh, analogy. The primary cell, the primary tumor, um, has metastasized. It's been hit with radiation. It's been hit with chemo. And where does the cancer metastasize to? Where it's toughest to get at it, to the lymph nodes. And if we're talking about um, a terrorism uh, metaphor, where are the places that are toughest to get at it? Yemen in Somalia, uh, in the Islamic Maghreb, um, potentially Nigeria. So spots where it's difficult to get at, uh, it can proliferate and really grow. So now the Al Qaeda threat looks like still that Al Qaeda core, though shrunken significantly, but now you've got um, affiliates and allies. Al Qaeda of the Islamic Maghreb, um, Al Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula, Al Shabaab in Somalia, some of the Pakistani groups, Turkey Taliban, uh, Lashkar e Taiba, Jaish e Mohammed, um, the remnants of Al Qaeda in Iraq. And you know, to some degree, I think there had been, a, for a period of time, a view that these affiliates and allies really only focused on their local theater of operations. Um, but really, that all changed on December 25th, 2009, when suddenly someone from Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula had the audacity to try and attack the homeland. So Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, their, their grievances, their issues weren't solely uh, restricted to their theater of operations. And then May of 2010, again, the Pakistani Taliban decide to attack New York City with a vehicle-borne explosive in Times Square. So again, another one of these groups acting out of their theater of operations. 
And I think that we would be remiss if we didn't think that there's a possibility that any number of these other groups, sort of part of this alphabet soup, um, a JEM, Al Shabaab, might do the same thing. And in fact, you know, David Headley was put on trial last year in Chicago, and they asked him, you know, is there any scenario where LET, who carried out the Mumbai attacks, would ever attack the United States? His response was yes. If LET could do it in a way that it wasn't obvious that they were behind it. Um, so that, that's, you know, in terms of future threat, things we have to be concerned about. Uh, you know, you've got all of these groups. And, uh, you know, which I think at this point in time makes for one of the most challenging counterterrorism environments uh, for a practitioner. Number one, you still have the remnants left from, well, I'd say number one, you still have people radicalizing to violence. Individual arrested in Tampa Bay, Florida, wanted to do uh, a vehicle-borne explosive on a mall. Individual who left the U.S. military, a signals officer, arrested on his way to, uh, to Somalia. That's just the last two weeks. Uh, individuals arrested in the UK, someone who wanted to stab a member of parliament. So in smaller groups, individual up in uh, upper Manhattan on the west side using pipe bombs that he made out of an Al-Qaeda magazine, how to make a bomb in the kitchen of your mom. Um, people are still radicalizing in the west. And now they can go one of three routes. They can still try and link up with Al-Qaeda core. Sure, we're down to remnants, and there are probably only a few people left who've got the ability to, uh, to instruct. But you know, if you look at the Zazi plot, which was called the, called the most serious plot on American soil since 9-11, what was it? It was essentially three young men from Flushing, Queens, one of them who got trained by uh, a bomb maker up in the uh, Fatah area, and a person who, and then he came back and recruited a couple of his friends, in a sense, into the plot. That's, that's the Zazi plot. That's the 7-7 seven, seven plot. So as long as there are one or two people left in Al-Qaeda who can train on how to make a hydrogen peroxide device, that threat, though diminished, still remains. Then you've got the ability for Westerners to join one of these other groups. A Faisal Shahzad can join a TTP. A Samir Khan can go join, uh, or an Abdul Muttalib can join an AQAP. Uh, any one of these groups, and now we can add Boko Haram potentially as another affiliate or ally who might decide to strike the West. And then you've got the, the individuals who are all kind of inspired, homegrown plots, who are still left out there. So to wrap up, what are the key judgments? Number one, and I get to play a little bit of Monday morning quarterback on this, but you know, 10 years after 9-11, we can say that Al-Qaeda Corps actual role in plots against the West has been overstated. That's not to say that the threat has been overstated, but they're actually their hand in the plots has been overstated. A lot more of the action for the conspiracies has been in the West by Westerners, independent of Al-Qaeda. But Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda has not actively recruited in the West. Really, with the one example of uh, the one exception of Lackawanna, where someone from Al Qaeda actually showed up in town and got people to go to a training camp, um, you don't really have top down recruitment from Al Qaeda. What you do have is sort of bottom up desire by individuals to go overseas, and Al Qaeda has been opportunistic. Someone shows up from Ho Copenhagen, they'll take them, they'll turn them around, and send them back to Denmark. Someone shows up from East London, they'll take them, train them, and turn them around, send them back to the UK. Someone shows up from Flushing, Queens, same thing. Turn them around, send them back to the US. So they've been opportunistic in who's shown up on their doorstep. Uh, and then lastly, what does that mean for the overall threat uh, with the demise of, of bin Laden? Um, well, my belief is that given the combination of Westerners who are continuing to radicalize and now this uh, multiplicity of options for them in terms of groups that they can hook up with or frankly go it alone, um, the threat has, has morphed, it's disaggregated, but there still is a significant threat that will require vigilance going forward. Thank you very much. clear um, and stimulating uh, uh, set of remarks. Let me, um, let me, let me um, ask you a couple of questions before I throw it up on the floor. Um, in a sense, your book is a uh, meditation on the Sageman-Hoffman debate. Um, and you don't, in the book, you don't really reference it directly. And you taught a class with Mark Sageman at Columbia. Um, and I guess the counter argument to the, what you've just said to that today might be something along the lines of, of yeah, of course, um, you know, plots that happen in the West are going to have a Western component. Uh, but what turns somebody who's just an angry person in their pajamas, you know, reading some internet blog about jihad into a capable bomber is a training in a training camp. And I think that you 
referenced yourself uh, to one of the people in the, pl in the planes plot who said, I really need, you know, building a hydrogen peroxide bomb ain't that easy. Uh, you're either going to blow yourself up or have a dud unless you know how to do it. It's very unstable uh, kind of. Uh, so if you I mean, just look, reviewing some of the cases that you've talked about, um, you know, the key, key person in each of these cases did go to a training camp, and I think that was a key part of their, so whether it's Ramzi Youssef or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or Mohammed Sadiq Khan or Omar Khayyam, um, and in a sense, these are the, what you, I can't remember the, the phrase you used to describe these, but if you take this guy out of the plot, the plot doesn't happen. Um, and you know, in the Lackawanna case, to me, it seems like if Carmel Dervish hadn't been in Yemen and remained in New York, upstate New York, you know, maybe that plot would have come out a different way. So just want to, how would you sort of address the kind of counter argument yeah, a couple things. I think, um, you know, and, and, you know, it was keen insight to sort of see that this really bounces between the, the Sageman-Hoffman argument and um, friends with both of them. Um, but, you know, I think both of them, in a sense, get points on, the de on this debate. And I always thought that the argument got pushed to extremes in the media, extremes that neither one of them sort of represented. You know, one of, if you look at the 16 plots, I end up identifying three of them as al-Qaeda command and control. So one could argue sort of leader-led jihad plots. Uh, there are about five which, or six. Which were the ones that you identified? So 9-11, so yeah. shoe bombers, um, and Operation Overt, you know, where not only someone Which is the planes plot. Which is the planes plot with the Gatorade bottles. Mm -hmm. Not only do they link up with al-Qaeda, uh, get some training by al-Qaeda, you know, but there was command and control. There was someone checking in on them to make sure that they were um, you know, doing what they were supposed to be doing going forward. Um, then there are about five or six plots that I've identified as Al-Qaeda inspired. And this is the way I organized the, the book. So um, the 1993 World Trade Center plot, because it sort of is, is pre-Al-Qaeda in, in some yeah. ways. Um, the Madrid plot, Toronto 18, um, the Operation Pendennis plot in Australia, um, and Hofstede. Then there are about six plots, or seven plots, that I call suggested and endorsed. Um, so to, to bounce off the Sageman-Hoffman argument, the, the ones that are command and control clearly fit uh, Bruce Hoffman's argument. Those that are Al-Qaeda inspired are, are Sageman's argument. Then there are some where it's a little murky. They met someone from Al-Qaeda. Um, maybe they even got some training, um, and then they went back to the West. And some of them, let's say like 7-7 and 721, we don't exactly know what Al-Qaeda's role is, was after that. We don't know if they gave them the direction. In 7-7, the guys took the answer to their grave. Although now we learn that in the, in the final months of the plot, there were phone calls coming into Mohammed Siddiqui Khan as he was building the device. Was that command and control or just instructions on the device? unclear. Um, but essentially there are about six or seven plots where there was some Al-Qaeda linkage, but not necessarily command and control. And those sort of fit in that middle ground, actually, between Bruce and, and Mark. Um, and then I think going forward, what we've seen is a proliferation of these smaller plots, homegrown plots. So I think from that standpoint, um, it looks like the trend line is going toward uh, more of the uh, inspired plots. Let me ask you sort of a, a, a question. Um, why does it matter? Um, I think it matters for a couple reasons. Number one, you know, on the big issues, um, when the United States decides whether it's going to do a surge in Afghanistan of 100,000 troops, it's sort of predicated on the idea that this is for the purpose of eliminating al Qaeda in Afghanistan. Um, so you, you, it involved in that, tied up in that, is your assessment of what is Al Qaeda? What are they? Are they in Afghanistan? And what are those hundred thousand troops going to be able to do? I, there? In fairness, the, uh, the the surge in Afghanistan is not was to prevent the possibility of Afghanistan returning to some form of Taliban control. It, it wasn't. It's a little bit less strongly. It's not to that they're trying to wipe out Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. No one is saying that, right? Well, I mean, that, that was certainly wrapped up in the discussions as to uh, a key, you know, I don't think it was one or the other, but certainly the Al-Qaeda, the purpose of degrading Al-Qaeda further was involved in that decision-making, um, you know, process. So I think, you know, that at least should be some data points that should be considered in terms of, 
And what, is that likely to end the Al Qaeda threat? I think is another question. You know, by its potential eradication in Afghanistan. Uh, so allocation of resources versus you know more resource, resources spent on the homegrown to in a sense stop the supply of people who are seeking to go overseas to disrupt them to identify them. Um, so I think that's you know, that's why it's important um, for resource allocation questions. Then also for in order to thwart the plot. If we're finding out that more and more plots aren't linked to Al Qaeda, then we have a less chance, uh, a, a lower chance of thwarting them via SIGINT or something along those lines. Your, how often is it that an NYPD official, NYPD official, gets to publish a book while sort of in office? And to what extent did you have to go through some sort of vetting uh, by your, by the people in the organization? Yeah, this, this was a pretty unconventional uh, event. I'd say there are zero data points uh, <laughs> before this. Um, yeah, and it, it did get vetted by NYPD, and I think one of the reasons why the process actually, uh, I mean, it was read once to give me suggestions and a second time to make sure I did them. Um, and there are no, like, blacked-out bits where, like, with the CIA for people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I managed to uh, circumnavigate that. Um, no, but really, because it wasn't p policy prescriptive, I think that was a key thing why it was allowed to go through. And really, it sort of let the, let the facts lay out as, as much as we knew them um, without necessarily having a strong um, opinion on what should be taken from that. One sort of final question before I throw it open. Um, in a sense, uh, because you mentioned LET, TTP, Al-Shabaab, AQAP, Boko Haram, uh, as all potential threats in the future. And then clearly these are not just a bunch of leaderless guys wandering around in Fatah or elsewhere. So it does seem that um, whenever somebody in the West has these ideas and then wants to go and execute, they do want to hook up with sort of an organization that will give them training. Um, and um, that's the whole point, that they will go somewhere geographical. Uh, and, and so to going back to this Afghanistan question, I mean, you know, the reason the we're in Afghanistan is partly to influence what happens, obviously, in the Fatah and the federally, federally administered tribal areas where so many of these groups are based and so many of the problems that you deal with every day are coming from. Um, so, I mean, in the next iteration of this book, uh, when you write the next version, will you be looking at the whole question of other organizations and, and their influence on plots uh, more broadly instead of just focusing on al-Qaeda? Yeah, I think... Um well, I'm going to hit that. I also wanted to come back to the training issue that you brought yeah. up before. Um, you know, clearly someone who's trained by a skilled person, uh, like we heard the individual in the liquid bomb plot, say he wanted to, potentially makes them more deadly. But, you know, there is just one counter to the argument is that in you know, the Madrid plot where no one went overseas um, and they just hooked up dynamite to cell phones, they killed 191 people, which actually is four times as many as Muhammad Siddiqui Khan, who we're pretty sure did get al-Qaeda training. So, and Oklahoma City is. Right, exactly, the non-jihadists. So sometimes it makes you more deadly in general, but that doesn't mean amateurs can't also be deadly, right. which is you know, sort of the way we're looking at it from a prevention stage. But um, you know, to, to, to this question, yeah, I think if there was another iteration of the book, and in fact I sort of made a, a conscious decision to exclude um, the Christmas Day plot, the May uh, 2010 Times Square plot, the um, David Headley plot against Copenhagen. So you could use different, the, the next iteration would be the other groups uh, and Westerners who have shown up on their doorstep um, and then been utilized um, back against the West. And I think is one of the biggest concerns the U.S. probably should have right now, um, whether we're concerned about individual of Somali descent from Minneapolis going overseas to Al-Shabaab or individuals going to uh, Mauritania, um, AQIM. And this idea of Westerners going out and then being sent directed back, I think in many ways probably the biggest concern. And it may not just be the training, it's also the kind of, you know, if you sort of you have bragging rights when you come back and you've hooked up with, you've, you've gone overseas and it makes you more of a more serious figure, right? It's beyond simply the sort of actual training on bomb making. It, I think it makes you a different person yeah, it certainly gives you that credibility. I mean, you know, the, the street cred that you've been overseas and have come back and, and puts you in a position to lead something, you know, if you're so inclined to do that. Great. Well, let's open it to uh, the audience. And if you have a question, can you uh, identify yourself and wait for the microphone? 
and also questions are encouraged rather than lengthy statements. Okay, he's just behind you. Hi, Shelton Williams with the Osgood Center. I, I, I know this is not in your book, but it begs the question, uh, how are we at uh, uh, anticipating and encountering these uh, events, or possible terrorist events, uh, your local, state, national, international, are we changing our approaches rapidly enough and effectively enough to counter these threats? The, the record would seem to be pretty good, uh, but it keeps changing, as you suggest. Are fusion centers working? Is DHS working? All those things. As an operations guy, let us know. Yeah, I think in general, the, uh, the scorecard is good. I mean, if you look at the last two years, uh, plus or minus, the, the FBI uh, nationally, the NYPD and the New York City metropolitan area have been tremendously successful in detecting individuals who are about to turn to violence. Um, and, you know, a couple of exceptions. Um, in a sense, someone like a Faisal Shahzad, you know, which was clearly an intelligence failure, a Zazi who was able to get to that point, um, a major Hassan. But in general, you know, there are a lot more successes. And, and these, are, these are needles in the haystack, especially as you get to smaller plots, micro conspiracies of one or two people. Um, how are you going to find these the guys? And in a sense, you know, law enforcement and intelligence are evolving because they realize that, you know what, the internet is increasingly more important and people who may not be visible in, in the physical world, uh, online they may think they're anonymous, but they can be detected. Does that mean that, I mean, somebody who is going to perpetrate the next attack would make damn sure that they weren't involved on the internet or communicating with people on the internet? Or is it just something that sort of is unavoidable, that I, people just won't? Abandon. Yeah, I think as they got into the operational phase, um, you know, they would sort of do the equivalent of what the 9-11 hijackers did when they came back from Afghanistan. They sort of shaved their beards and didn't hang out with anybody. Right. So sort of the internet version of that, <laughs> um, where they would observe some type of operational security. The interesting thing is that, you know, uh, online, uh, your, your footprint uh, to some degree is usually immortal. So even when we've looked at people like uh, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, the underwear bomber, you can go back five years and he's, I think, lonely Farouk in London. And he's online saying, I'd, I'd like to do something, <laughs> I want to get involved, you know, and he's just a college student, but, but his, his footprint's there, and that's retrospective. But, so I think people would try and, and observe operational uh, security, but um, they may have already given enough um, signatures that you might detect them. In your job, to what extent are you looking at other forms of political violence, right wing, left wing, environmental, you know, you name it, eco? Uh, is that part of your remit, or is you, are you... Yeah, no, I mean, it is. And for the NYPD, I think, you know, and, and I think in general, everyone's focused for, with New York on the Al-Qaeda type threat. Um, but really, the, our, our, our remit is broad. You know, any type of political religious violence, um, you know, falls under our auspices. Um, we've had some unsolved bombings um, of a recruiting center, of a British embassy, and, and devices that didn't kill anybody, but they're more of an anarchist nature. Um, so you know, things like that need to be investigated as well. You were obviously spinning up quite uh, a lot uh, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11 for obvious. There was also some indication there was a sort of shards of a plot, as I think you, you were sort of pursuing. Uh, what happened to that? There were three guys, maybe one of them was, uh, they were from North African. Or what were the details of that? And did it, was there just nothing to it? You know, you know, essentially there was information that came in, in from a, a reliable source that uh, suggested that there was something in motion. Um, and essentially, you know, sometimes with, with intelligence and sometimes with plots, um, you're left sort of uh, with that hanging information. It doesn't necessarily go away or get, um, you know, vetted out that it's false, but you don't get any more dots to sort of support that thesis and you're left to something you're scratching your head. You know, if it hasn't been disrupted, was it ever real to begin with? Um, but you also can't keep up your defenses of essentially shutting down the city of New York to all of vehicular traffic indefinitely. <laughs> so at a certain point, we have to open up the bridges. And also you publicized it. So 
maybe people were scared off if it existed in the first place. Was that a very self-conscious decision? Yeah, it was. I think it was a view toward deterrence um, and the idea that, um, especially since there was so much unknown about it, that this might be something useful uh, to deter someone from doing it for their fear that they're already um, detected. Doug. Hi, Doug Oliver, Doug Ollivant with New America. Um, historically speaking, isn't this exactly what we should be expecting from a, an organization that sees itself with a world-changing, multi-generational mission? Um, I, I think of maybe like the Society of Jesus, you know, in, in, the, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, you know, when, when they're trying to re-Catholicize England, they're sitting right across the, the, you know, right across in France, directing it as best they can, but then when it's China, they just send uh, Ricci, as I recall, just, you know, you go to China and do what Jesuits do. Um, isn't this really normal behavior, historically speaking, for this kind of, you know, religious political organization? And, and by that, do you mean sort of the decentralized element of it, or? Yeah, yeah, using whatever means of command and control seems most appropriate, you know, directly mm -hmm. and closely when you can, um, sending one loan agent, you know, with very broad instructions when you can, or just providing kind of, you know, exemplar causality when you can't get someone in there to, to do something for you directly. Doug, that is the first time that Al-Qaeda has been compared to the Jesuits, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> and I think when I leave here, I've got to go straight to Wikipedia to get smart on that. <laughs> um, so not being entirely familiar with that example, but... Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think Al-Qaeda has turned to this strategy out of necessity. So, you know, in a sense, here's the good news, right? The good news is that special forces, coalition forces, drones have done a phenomenal job in degrading and taking really important Al-Qaeda people off the battlefield. People like the chief of external operations um, again and again and again. And, and in many ways, that's one of the most important spots because that's the guy who's directing plots at the West. Um, so what do they do? You know, they're, they, they're under uh, attack in, in Afghanistan. They're hiding in Pakistan. Um, they jump on the bandwagon of this sort of decentralized movement. Um, and there are ideologues in Al-Qaeda, al-Suri, who put that out there. So you know, they can, they've got some uh, legitimacy to do it. But you know, they then endorse Inspire Magazine. Inspire Magazine says, hey, wait a second. People are getting arrested going overseas. Um, don't try and do it. Do something at home. You don't need to go overseas. You've got the, uh, we're sanctioned to do it. So Al Qaeda jumps on that bandwagon and, and says, yeah, that's right. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin Tua. Uh, in light of your focus on the bottom up nature of many of these plots, uh, recruitment, uh, walk in, self activation, and uh, the fact that how we define terrorism and act against it uh, can complicate the efforts, uh, our efforts to reduce the threat from it. Uh, how do you uh, view in that context the controversy over the uh, Islamic Cultural Center near Ground Zero uh, before, uh, I guess, the uh, elections in uh, 2010? I mean, you know, so that issue is, is to some degree faded out of the spotlight. It doesn't look like it's going forward or, or at least in forward in a way that it was originally conceived of. Um, you know, I think the country, United States, has, has such a history of tolerance of all different religious races and creeds. Um, so the idea that you should be able to have a religious center, you know, anywhere was an important one for, for the mayor to uphold. Um, that said, there, you know, I do know that there wasn't necessarily um, a population who underserved in that area um, by uh, scarcity of, uh, of, of religious institutions. So, uh, you know, one has to wonder a little bit, um, was there a provocative nature to choosing that spot by the people who, who were behind it? I don't know. I don't know what their intentions were. Um, but regardless of what their true intentions were, I think you know, the mayor you know, clearly made the right decision in, in endorsing their ability to go forward. Um, because if you just say, look, religious institution anywhere in New York City, you know, have to be allowed to do it. Uh, 
Reg Smith, RCS Associates. I um, realize that uh, NYPD considers this a serious threat and, and acts accordingly. I understand that NYPD and the FBI have worked effectively for years long before 9-11. I was wondering if you would like to comment on whether, how this helps the Al-Qaeda factor. In terms of how NYPD and FBI working together helps? Right. Um, yeah, there, there's actually a very natural um, collaborative way that the FBI and NYPD can work together because essentially the FBI is getting information um, you know, from the CIA, from the NSA, uh, from the threat that emanates overseas. Um, and they're going to bring that you know, to any locality um, and be aware of that. And the NYPD actually starts at the exact opposite end. The NYPD is in, in, in the weeds looking at the grassroots origins of the terrorism, looking for the individuals who are radicalizing to violence you know, in our neighborhoods. Um, and it's really when the two meet, you have some of the most serious plots, like uh, Anaji Balazazi from Flushing, Queens, meeting up with Al-Qaeda and then sent back to New York. Um, so there's a, there's a, we're complementary efforts. And um, you know, the more that we continue to work together in that way, uh, you know, just uh, helps keep New York City and, and the country safe. Was there a discussion at uh, NYPD of the Barcelona plot in 2008 when Pakistani Taliban sent suicide bombers to Barcelona and saying we need to think about this as a problem, or was it? Yeah, I mean, you know, NYPD, I think, was ahead of the curve in thinking about the idea that affiliates and allies might attack the homeland. And uh, I'll even go, you know, five years earlier um, to L.E.T. and Willie Brigitte in Sydney, Australia. So let me get this right. Um, someone from um, the Caribbean is essentially sent by L.E.T. to Australia to survey targets for a plot on L.E.T.'s behalf. Um, so here was an affiliate or an ally looking to target a Western country. And then fast forward to 2008 um, with a, a TTP plot in Barcelona. Yeah, so we, we believed before Christmas Day of 2009 that there was a decent shot that an affiliate or ally um, might target uh, the U.S. Has there been any evidence that L.E.T. is interested in attacking <laughs> The United States or New York in particular? Have you seen anything? Um, you know, the, not specifically for New York City, although David Headley is commonly called of David Headley from Chicago, but he actually uh, is David Headley really from New York. He used to have a video rental store on the Upper West Side. Uh, one of my analysts actually was a member, um, you know, pre, pre LET of uh, the video store. But, um, you know, LET recruited some of those individuals from the Virginia paintball plot to provide supplies to them. There was never a plot, per se, against suburban Washington, D.C. Um, but also, within the last six months, there's been an individual who was arrested in the Washington, D.C. area who was setting up a website um, that L.E.T. had asked him to do in English. Um, so this was, an, and, and really it was support for an FTO. So we've got, um, shadows of L.E.T. sort of operating here, um, not necessarily a plot per se, but you know, one has to wonder as, as the U.S.-Pakistani relationship continues to deteriorate, um, is there some point where L.E.T. is useful um, from, a, from an asymmetrical warfare type of standpoint? It clearly would be at a point when things have gotten very bad, um, but just something you know, to, to keep in the back of your mind. That's Eric. Just, uh, just lady here. Hi, Anne Liliana. My question is from a, a state and local um, enforcement prevention perspective. So we have this book, and is there a lesson plan? I read this book, and I start plotting on a map, and then I start looking in my region as to um, certain populations. Where do I go based on your book as far as trying to apply the lessons and the information and the analysis you've given us? 
to try to understand and identify what m may be going on? You know, it, it turns out that it's a very specialized um, capability to be able to detect individuals who are radical, radicals, uh, radicalizing to violence. Um, you know, the FBI has that remit nationally. There's no reason why they can't cooperate with local agencies who know the, the, uh, the ground truth very well. Um, and the idea is to find out where are those hot spots for radicalization, where are the nodes, um, the hubs in that social network where people are radicalizing, and then essentially to try and see if you can observe uh, the beginnings of a conspiracy and, and have um, an individual um, there to sort of serve as a tripwire and identify it. But it really becomes a detection issue, um, but it's a specialized thing. The, the cop on a beat, it's going to be tough for them to, to find the guys in Muhammad Atta's apartment, in a sense, you know, radicalizing. It's not going to be blatantly apparent to them. Does the internet make it easier? I mean, Major Nadal Hassan was exchanging emails with al which seemed to have been, over, I mean, they were pretty like, you know, is it okay for me to kill American soldiers was yeah. one of the questions he asked. Um, why did that ball get dropped? Do you have a theory on that? Um, you know, I, I think with Major Hassan, you had the complication of um, a few different field offices in the FBI having ownership. Anything al related is owned in San Diego because that's where al uh investigation was going back to 9-11. The fact that he was in the Washington, D.C. area, the fact that JTTFs in general, you know, people inside the task force are really not allowed to take the information out of the task force. So even though the military is part of it, the information doesn't flow easily out of the task force because of um, security concerns. So you know, the information flow between the field offices, between the, uh, you know, the Department of Defense, um, you know, there were problems in that. And, you know, the Lieberman-Collins report, um, I think, is, does a really good job of digging into the weeds, you know, of the, of the problems in the communication there. But I think the Internet gives us another medium to detect people. Um, the individual who stabbed the member of parliament because of his support of the, of the Iraq war, Roshana Chowdhury, was a follower of Revolution Muslim. So, you know, on some of these websites, um, you know, there are people interacting there. Someone else was also arrested in the UK who was a follower of that website, Samir Khan, you know, at Link. So there are individuals, so if you know sort of the, the hubs or these sort of um, hot spots on the internet, they also can lead you to people. The gentleman in the back room. Thank you. My name is Ivo Puljik. I'm from Al Jazeera Balkans, new branch of Al Jazeera. Uh, I would like to know, it's actually a question for both of you, if you can, please. Uh, did you find that during your research uh, some connections between uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, Balkans, uh, southeast of Europe, Bosnia, Kosovo, or whole region? And other question is, uh, what do you think about some uh, connections between immigrants in U.S. and uh, terrorist groups overseas? Thank you. Let me take that second part um, first. You know, I think we don't understand it well yet, but there has been a trend since 2007 uh, of people who, of individuals of, of Balkan descent, um, getting involved into Al Qaeda type terrorism. Um, you've got the Fort Dick Six. A few members of the group were of Balkan heritage, the Duca brothers. Um, you've got a couple of the individuals um, who were involved in the uh, North Carolina Seven uh, of Balkan descent. Um, in the Zazi plot in New York City, uh, Addis, and I'm going to probably not say his name right, you'll correct me, uh, Addis Medianjan, you know, you know, involved, um, you know, one of the three people involved uh, in the plot. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know what's under, this individual arrested in Tampa Bay, um, uh, also of Balkan descent. So for some reason, the ideology is appealing to a small segment, but, but a segment of individuals of Balkan descent. Um, and we know that generally, um, you know, the observance of, of Islam in the Balkans is a very tolerant, um, you know, sort of multicultural, almost westernized Islam. So we don't know why, but it is a, a da a trend line that we're looking at. Gentleman here. 
Are you uh, from the Voice of America Afghanistan service? My question is uh, a little out of the subject. It's the, on the Taliban peace negotiations and address to uh, both. Uh, and if uh, Mr. Bergen would like to address, and if you, if you don't want to s spend time on this, I can do it after the, the oh. session. Do you have anything to say about that? Um, on that, no, no, not too much. Right. Um, uh, that's okay. So we'll that Mitch now. is the person who's answering the questions in the, over here of this gentleman in the back. Steve Luckett, I'm a news producer in television here in the city. Thanks for the forum today, Mr. Bergen. Fantastic stuff. Um, I didn't know, sir, if you um, had hoped to get through one forum without the mention of Iran, so I don't mean to disappoint you today. Um, this forum comes, I think, a couple hours after James Clapper's remarks on the Hill about uh, the prospect of Iran uh, being formidable in attacking or mapping out a strat strategy to attack the United States. And it also comes a couple of days after published reports and more published reports about the prospect of um, Al Qaeda being given sanctuary and safe haven in Iran. So, could you ruminate on the prospect of a marriage between the two and how they might pose a, a, an imminent threat to the U.S.? Well, I think since you use the word uh, marriage, uh, you know, I'll add the word complicated, you know, to it. <laughs> um, and and I want, I'm not sure if marriage is even the, the best way to describe. It, but I mean, there there has been different types of relationships between uh, Al-Qaeda and Iran, whether it's the travel of some of the 9-11 hijackers through Iran, sort of sort of passive, um, the house arrest of some senior leadership members, you know, in, in Iran. So, uh, you know, it certainly doesn't seem to be a close working partnership or relationship, but maybe some tacit um, acceptance or tolerance uh, of it. Um, it's unclear how, if there's some type of conflict in the Persian Gulf between the U.S. and Iran, how that plays out, you know, with al-Qaeda. Uh, sort of tough, tough to predict uh, on that front. Um, but I think what, from the New York City standpoint, um, I would say is that if there is some type of conflict um, in the Gulf, we're going to be on high alert for a variety of reasons. Number one, the idea that Hezbollah might act as an Iranian surrogate, uh, depending on the nature of the conflict. Uh, and we've already had uh, members of the Ira Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, expelled from New York City as persona non grata and surveillance done on the subway in years past. Um, and given high- What was that, by the way, Mitch? That one, we had a couple events. Uh, one of them was in 03. Um, hmm. And the other one, I think, was 2004, I believe. Hmm. Um, so, you know, somewhat dated, but, you know, given our high level of, uh, of targets that are, have Israeli or, or Jewish linkages in New York City and, and past Hezbollah attacks um, in, in Buenos Aires against those targets, we're, we're significantly concerned about that. And that the idea of a, a Western attack or a U.S. attack on Iran would, would fit in the narrative that we were talking about earlier. There's a war against Islam. First it was Afghanistan, then it was Iraq, now it's Iran. And granted, there's a, this is you know, Sunni versus Shia. There may be people of the homegrown variant that sort of see this in a continuum and, and act out violently um, on behalf of, of Iran. So it, it's something that we're following very closely. Did you cons get, were you concerned at NYPD about uh, U.S. NATO action in Libya? And uh, clearly, I mean, uh, the, why, why wasn't that seen as an attack on an Islamic country? Yeah, no, we were concerned. We, yeah. we, asked, us the, we asked the question internally. We said, okay, well, how would this play out here? Mm -hmm. um, you know, or is there travel between the U.S. and Libya? How would someone from Libya get into the United States or New York? Um, what might be targets? for uh, Libyans? Might the, uh, you know, might the mission, the UN mission, be a target? Mm -hmm. So we actually asked ourselves those issues. Um, I, don't know, I think the, the Libya, because the Arab League's participation, maybe that defanged a little bit of it um, in terms of uh, another Western war against the Muslim country. Gaddafi himself. What's that? Gaddafi himself. Gaddafi himself, yeah, doesn't inspire a lot of followers. So. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen here. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would like to know the Pakistani factor. You talked about Al-Qaeda factor. I would like to, I, you mentioned that already, but I would like to know uh, what role the Pakistani groups or the Pakistani madrasas played in these plots. 
the first question. And the second question is, in terms of ideology, did you find any consistency that you can connect these old plots to a certain school of thoughts uh, within Islam? And also, did you find any kind of counter frame to the way you were looking at jihad, at global jihad? That could be you know, just something that can be promoted against a violent form of jihad? Um, okay, so there are a few questions sort of rolled up into that. I think the first one is the most problematic. Uh, the groups of the madrasas. Yeah, is there a kind of religious strain? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, no. um, so let me get to that. Not first. <laughs> uh, you know, in terms of the groups, um, and I mentioned this in the talk, oftentimes other groups, be it LET, uh, Jaishi Muhammad, Harkat al Mujahideen, have sort of been the conveyor belt or a facilitator for individuals in the West who didn't have a direct Al Qaeda connection to make that connection. So the groups have been very important in that sense. Um, I think uh, Bruce Rydell has described it as a syndicate up there. And that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good analogy. Um, in terms of madrasas, actually most of the people who have been involved in these plots were not the products of Pakistani uh, madrasas. So that sort of ended up uh, not being a real place to identify people involved in plots against the West. Um, in terms of the religious ideology, um, you know, I said there were two on-ramps to the scene. One's political, one's religious. And you know, if we're, we're talking about the religious side of the equation, it's people who are adopting a literalist interpretation of Islam. Um, could be a Salafi, it could be Wahhabi, it could be uh, Diobandi, like Tablighi Jamaat. And again, those aren't terrorism. And they don't, it's not a preordained conclusion that someone who adopts that literalist interpretation, that ultra-orthodox interpretation, that they will turn to violence. But those ideologies um, have a lower threshold uh, and are, are, there are conditions that, that can be met that would uh, obligate or justify violence. And I think that's why some of those ideologies often precede people's uh, move forward to violence. Okay, one final question here. Yeah, my name is Li Yang. Uh, I just wonder, besides ideologies, uh, I think from their training to, to the Al-Qaeda and uh, their personal background, why do they resent or hate the uh, uh, West country? And actually, some terrorists, uh, they arrest or something is so American-born citizens, American white, right? So I just wonder, from their background, why do they hate or what, whether they have been arrested before or whether they are family or, or something they feel very unjust? Right. Can I, can I also add to that? Yeah. I mean, it strikes me that some of the people that we've seen show up in these cases, whether Jihad Jane or others, you know, that um, there isn't a weather underground, there isn't the Black Panthers, sort of Marxist, leftist groups don't have much attraction, and that if you want to act out against the American government, for whatever reason, Al-Qaeda or its ideology provides a way to do it. Have you sort of thought about that as an issue? Or, and are there other ideologies coming along that we should be concerned about that 10 years from now, uh, Mitch Silber will be writing about? Yeah, I, I think to some degree the lack of alternatives on the left, um, on the far left, may be a rationale for some people to to see uh, similar goals as some of those ultra left wing organizations, um, so that may f facilitate people's. You know, you saw in some of the um, good analogies for the anti Iraq war protests in the UK. So you had people from, let's say, the Al Muhajirun groups demonstrating, but you also had people from the left who were demonstrating against the war. In a sense, they had a, a commonality of, of goals there, and they probably disagree on almost any other issue. But on this political issue, they were sort of um, in alignment. Um, but I think you, we have seen this trend of converts getting involved in plots, um, whether Hispanic converts, female converts, um, you know, Bryant Neal Vinyas, uh, you know, a choir boy from Long Island convert. Um, some of these people are lost. They're looking for um, a mission in life. Um, some of these other movements don't exist anymore, and there's a certain coolness to, to, to the jihad. As odd as it is to say, it's macho, you're fighting, you've got a gun. Um, it's that outward bound with guns type of thing. There's a cause. Um, 
they're not necessarily sure what they're for, but they know what they're against. They're against Western imperialism, and it sort of fits hand in glove if they've adopted a certain interpretation of Islam that sort of works well you know, with that uh, political um, analysis. Do you regret the KSM trial? It will not be in New York City. No, I, I regret that KSM has not been put on trial because right. I think you know the United States and the Allies put Nazis on trial after World War II. They killed a lot more people than Al Qaeda, so um, justice should be served and, and they should be on trial. But um, New York wasn't the appropriate place for it. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, there's some books, uh, so Mitch will be willing to sign afterwards. And we really want to thank you for thank you. a brilliant presentation. Appreciate it.